Good evening. Um, I was just staring at the um, title slide here as we are getting going and this uh, kind of aerial photograph or satellite photograph of Beaver Island. And it reminds me of all the different times when I've been flying in an airplane a jet over Lake Michigan and I see, look down and I just always am excited when I fly over Beaver Island and get to see it because I'm very familiar with this particular, looks like a fantasy map on here, but I'm very familiar with this image um, of this island because I've mapped it several times uh, in order to, because of this topic that we're talking about tonight, which I'm pretty excited about. So I want to welcome you this evening to our History, Theology, and Philosophy Meetup. Uh, we're streaming these live every Tuesday at 8 Eastern um, while we're not doing in-person meetings. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, also though, have some community aspect by taking your questions uh, in the course of this. My name is John Hamer and I serve as the coordinator of the uh, Meetup. Uh, by training, I'm a historian and I've been a professional map maker. Uh, one of the topics that I've done actually a lot of uh, direct uh, study of is the Latter Day, the history of the Latter Day Saint movement, and even specifically a lot of uh, original research in the Strangite branch of the movement, which was a very fascinating chapter. So we'll be interested tonight for that. We always begin with our mission, which is to invite everyone into community, to continually learn and grow, to abolish poverty and end needless suffering to promote peace and justice, and to live life meaningfully together. That's our mission together. Uh, we'll remind you always that uh, our capacity to um, put on different streaming services and classes and, and uh, meditations is because of your generous donations, and we really appreciate those. Uh, you can always go to our website, and there's a big button there uh, that says support center place and we really appreciate uh, all the donations that have come in and that really again helps us to continue to do all of this programming next week uh, we're having an interesting topic we're looking at uh, the evidence that some several scholars have uh, formulated that uh, one of the evangelists one of the authors of the canonical gospels of the Christian New Testament might have been actually female, might have been a, a, a female disciple. Um, all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those we think, oh, well, Luke wrote it. Luke's a male name. But actually, all of these are names that are assigned later by tradition. The gospels are all anonymous. And so as looking f at the text of Luke, um, there are another number of reasons why, anyway, several scholars have um, said, hey, wait a second, uh, this maybe is expressing female concerns or female perspective that we wouldn't be, we aren't seeing in the other evangelists. And so we'll look at it. It's a very interesting idea anyway. Tonight we are talking, as I mentioned, about James J. Strang and the Mormon kingdom on Beaver Island in the 1850s. Um, this is not known too well as a chapter in Latter-day Saint history outside of Michigan. In Michigan, this is like one of the, the couple handful of stories that uh, people know from state history uh, because it's a very interesting chapter. Um, and it's got a little bit of and people who know a lot about Mormon history anyway, maybe know a little bit about this story because it is pretty fascinating. But uh, even though it's a little obscure, I think it's worth uh, telling because uh, it's interesting as a study of a particular uh, path of what might have been and an interesting institutional story of what, what actually did happen. Uh, we look here at an overall larger kind of uh, map of the area. You can see where I am here in Toronto um, and looking across the whole Great Lakes region, uh, Michigan and Ontario uh, are kind of peninsulas that uh, make their way into the middle of the different uh, Great Lakes. And uh, you can see here on the map uh, how uh, the lower and upper peninsulas of Michigan, the Beaver Island is the big island in, that, in the lakes there in Lake Michigan. And I also highlighted here uh, Mackinac Island, which is important because it is uh, 
a very early European fort and settlement, and so it was uh, actually the kind of early capital for traders and things like that, settler traders, and was ultimately a, a real rival, the, the central rival of where the, the Mormon settlements of Beaver Island were opposed by the existing uh, Michigander settlements on, on Mackinac. And I'll just point out a couple other places on this map here for context. We have over in New York State, Palmyra. So this is the area where the Latter-day Saint movement gets started. Kirtland there in Ohio by Lake Erie is where the original temple of the Latter-day Saint movement, the Community Christ Temple in Kirtland is located. And then over on the other side in, in uh, Wisconsin territory, what was the territory then, uh, there's a town there, Voree, which is the first um, uh, Strangite settlement. And in fact, it's actually where uh, the Strangite church today is, is headquartered. So here's an account uh, about Coronation Day as recalled by a Strangite Mormon named Celia Seaman Hill. She writes, I was anxious to be present and managed to get into the tabernacle on Beaver Island. This is a big uh, log edifice uh, where they had church. At one end was a platform and towards it marched a procession of elders and other quorums escorting the king. First came the king dressed in a robe of bright red and accompanied by his council. Then followed the 12 elders, the apostles, the 70, and the minor orders of the ministry as they were called. The people were permitted to occupy what space remained in the tabernacle. The chief ceremonials were performed by George J. Adams, president of the Council of Elders. Adams was a man of imposing presence. He was over six feet tall and he towered over the short statured king who, however, made up in intellect what he lacked in frame Adams had been an actor, and he succeeded in making the crowning of the king a very imposing ceremony. It ended by placing upon the auburn head of Strang a crown of metal. The crown was a thin circlet with a cluster of stars projecting in front. Okay, so that's an interesting description um, of an actual coronation which took place uh, in the United States, <laughs> you know, in the middle of the 19th century. So it's not an unusual thing for there to be a king uh in anyway in the republic that is the united states so james jesse strang who was strang um why was he crowned king on an island in lake michigan <laughs> and then what happened to his kingdom and his followers um so a couple of weeks ago um i had a lecture on divisions within christianity and i kind of had a mapped out how the different branches of christianity emerged from um, the kind of uh, state religion of the Roman Empire, Nicene Christianity of the fourth century, which uh, split into Greek East and the Latin West. Uh, the Latin West uh, was divided in the modern times between Roman Catholic uh, Christianity and then the Protestants and Anglicans. And coming out of the Protestant Christianity, um, we then had this restoration movement, this movement that wanted to um, do even more reformation, but in, with the goal of trying to uh, eliminate anything within Christianity that isn't, uh, that they weren't reading about in the Bible, so that they could be living as if they were uh, the original primitive Christian movement that you read about in the book of Acts. And so out of that impetus, we have groups like the Disciples of Christ or the Churches of Christ, uh, the Stone Campbell movement, and also deriving from that as the Latter-day Saint and Mormon movement. And so this idea then of the restorationism of Christian primitivism, um, it's for, uh, thoroughly founded in Protestantism. So it is very Protestant. Um, and even Mormons who uh, reject Protestant label um, are actually uh, steeped in kind of a Protestant foundation uh, for their initial ideas. So the goal of reforming the practices and beliefs of the primitive Christianity is in basing all that on the New Testament accounts, as I mentioned. It's anti-sectarian, 
And so what they were really hoping to do is eliminate the idea of having Methodists and Lutherans and, and Presbyterians and Anglicans and instead bring everybody together in a church called Church of Christ. And so often in these um, churches, like the Disciples of Christ, the Churches of Christ, they, they tend to be called Church of Christ um, because that's what they're kind of going for. And so examples include, like I say, the Churches of Christ and in Canada, the Evangelical Christian Church. So one of Alexander Campbell, who is a lead, one of these founders of the Church of Christ, of the Disciples of Christ, one of his important early associates was a minister in the area around Kirtland, Ohio, named Sidney Rigdon. Um, but Sidney Rigdon broke with Campbell in 1830 after becoming convinced that Joseph Smith's Book of Mormon was a true gospel. Rigdon then brought hundreds of followers into Smith's small struggling church, and as a result of that, actually Smith and all his people moved to Kirtland, which became the headquarters of their church. That's actually, so in that, in some sense, um, uh, the birth of the Latter-day Saint movement is actually a merger of Sidney Rigdon's much larger movement with uh, Joseph Smith's very interesting and dynamic movement uh, coming together in the territory where Sidney's church had been. So uh, like Campbell and Rigdon, Joseph Smith and initially had sought to end Protestant sectarianism and restore uh, the true primitive Christian church. Uh, and so his goal was that they, to say, okay, none of the Baptists and Methodists, those are, none of them are correct. And instead we need to organize uh, a church of Christ, which he did in Palmyra, New York on April 6, 1830. Uh, that uh, church later was renamed Church of the Latter-day Saints. Uh, ultimately, it's gone through a bunch of different names, but anyway, so it was originally called Church of Christ. Uh, Smith uh, himself was a visionary, and he claimed eventually titles that included prophet, seer, revelator, and translator, among other titles. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that attracted Sidney Rigdon and actually uh, the other people who joined in with Smith's Church of Christ with his restoration was the publication of a new book of scripture in 1830 called the Book of Mormon. So Joseph Smith claimed to have translated the text into English, quote, by the gift and power of God uh, from a text that was engraved on golden plates. Smith reported then visions of an angel who told him where the plates had been buried. And he had several witnesses who had visions of the plates and who then also lifted a box that was said to contain the plates uh, in order to kind of have verify the idea of this artifact. So um, once they merged together, uh, Smith and Rigdon's followers were counseled to gather and build up a, uh, a city of Zion uh, in anticipation of an eminent literal second coming of Christ. Uh, and so, uh, other than the Book of Mormon and Smith of the Revelations, uh, the church was initially, I'm sorry, initially doctrinally quite similar to contemporary Protestantism, and it differed chiefly in its evolving structure of lay priesthood offices and councils. And so there started to be, um, uh, there started with the original uh, uh, priesthood offices that are things like elder and uh, teacher and deacon. Uh, and, and pastor, and they ultimately added things like uh, bishops, 70s, apostles, high priests, and so on and so forth. So it became a much more elaborate structure. Um, the church also moved um, for various reasons. Um, and so they initially, as we mentioned, there is that beginning phase of Palmyra, Manchester up there in New York, which is where Joseph Smith started out, uh, moving to Kirtland, which is where Sidney Rigdon already was. Um, they identified this area around Kansas City, uh, Independence, as the place where that would be the center place, as it was called in Revelation, of the new Jerusalem uh, for this imminent second coming, uh, but not getting along with the Missourians and getting kicked out of Missouri. Um, they moved, fled as refugees to Illinois, where they founded the uh, city of Nauvoo, uh, which is Anyway, a geographical um, movement of the church in addition to all kinds of other evolution that is going on at the time. So in the course of that um, uh, kind of rapidly evolving uh, movement, there was also a kind of a change in focus. 
So whereas when they first were getting together, um, they were focusing on New Testament Christian primitivism. But as they went along, uh, they really started turning their attention to the Old Testament. And so some of the new ordinances included things like patriarchal blessings. Uh, and that comes out of a reading of uh, Genesis, where the Old uh, Testament patriarchs give blessings to their descendants. And then there was a ritual that was called the endowment that was uh, added in Nauvoo. It's based on Masonic temple ceremonies. And because the Freemasons had said that that comes back to the Old Testament Temple of Solomon. Uh, we know that's not the case, but in any event, people in the 19th century believed that, Smith believed that, um, he restored that uh, for that ceremony. So it's a, the idea now that there would be a restoration of all things. And one of the all things that got thrown into that mix was the restoration of Old Testament polygamy. So the idea that uh, Abraham and uh, Jacob and Isaac all had more than one uh, wife. So um, also what did happen, um, kind of in secret, but uh, nevertheless was one of the things that happened at the end of Joseph Smith's life in Nauvoo um, was another restoration, a restoration of what he called the kingdom. So in his final months, Joseph Smith organized a theocratic kingdom of God uh, with a council of 50 men, it wasn't exactly 50, but it was always called the Council of 50, who were sworn to very serious secrecy. And in a ceremony uh, at the Council of 50 on April 11th, 1844, uh, Smith was acclaimed King of the Kingdom of God on Earth at a secret meeting of that council. And so um, this is the direct precedent for that ceremony we were, uh, re I read about at the beginning with Strang. So although this is arguably treasonous, uh, um, it was leaked, though, to an opposition newspaper uh, uh, and was threatening, which was threatening to print the account. And so as a result of that, um, Smith, who was the mayor and the head of the courts and the general of the militia, ordered the newspaper uh, destroyed, which it was. Um, so as a result of that, um, Smith was arrested for destroying the newspaper. Um, and that led directly to his assassination by a mob of Illinois militiamen uh, on June 27, 1844. So when that happened, um, Joseph Smith, who had been the leader of the movement, who hadn't actually, uh, a lot of times when you are the founder of something, you haven't necessarily made plans for um, that what's going to happen after you, uh, because in a lot of cases, people don't aren't ever thinking about the time with not them. Uh, he had... Um, Joseph Smith had said all kinds of different things about who successors might be, um, but unfortunately there was not, it wasn't entirely, everything wasn't entirely clear. Uh, in any event, um, his death uh, and the fact that his brother, who was um, his principal, let's say, uh, assistant, uh, kind of his vice president, died at the same time. Um, at the time of his death, then, most of the church leaders, um, including Sidney Rigdon and the Apostles, were actually campaigning for Smith, who was running uh, in the 1844 presidential race as his own candidate. So what ended up happening uh, then when uh, the leaders returned to Nauvoo to decide who was going to be in charge, um, there were kind of two camps. Uh, and the one camp uh, were people who had been inducted into um, some of these secret ordinances that were going on, including, for example, uh, the polygamy, and who had had, therefore, that affect their families and who were um, very committed to finding a successor who was going to continue that. And then, on the other hand, um, there were essentially the reformers, uh, the people who were opposed to that, the people who wanted to make a compromises with uh, the surrounding people in the state of Illinois by returning to a law and order to stop stop doing things like uh, like the polygamy, for example, and that included um, Joseph Smith's widow Emma Smith. Um, they essentially looked to Sidney Rigdon uh, to be uh, who argued that he should be made guardian of the church. Um, his great rival, then Brigham Young, who was the leader of the Apostles, argued that instead, in fact, instead of there being any one successor. Um, that the 12 apostles should be put in charge of the church. And then Brigham Young, once that, once that occurred, once the people agreed to that, then Brigham Young, who's the head of the apostles, 
uh, was sort of de facto in charge of Nauvoo. So uh, Sidney Rigdon, having been outmaneuvered by uh, Young, by Brigham Young, his life was pretty quickly threatened, uh, and he felt that he had to leave Nauvoo. He moved uh, back to Pennsylvania, which is where he was from, and he started to organize a competing church headquarters in Pittsburgh. And so then he initially rallied all kinds of opponents to um, the rule of the Twelve Apostles in Nauvoo. Um, but as often happens um, when there is a reform movement, um, one of the things uh, that Sidney Reagan, one of the errors that Sidney Reagan kind of had was deciding, okay, well, where did we go wrong? And so if you take the onion and you start peeling back layers and you say, okay, we definitely went wrong when we, when we started doing this polygamy, or we, and you get rid of that, or we went wrong when, um, uh, I don't know, when we, when we in, in started having these endowments uh, that are based on, on, on Freemasonry, or we went wrong when we um, organized having a, a high priesthood and we got away from the uh, offices that are only mentioned in the New Testament. And so as, as you start r rolling those all back, then people, uh, you lose people that are committed to those later ideas. And so um, through that and also some fairly unstable leadership by just a few years in 1847, Sidney Rigdon's organization had pretty well collapsed. So, meanwhile, back in Brigham Young, I'm sorry, back in Nauvoo, um, Brigham Young is able to consolidate uh, his rule, but um, because of uh, the fact that polygamy and some of the other things were still all going on, um, that became increasingly untenable as the Illinoisan neighbors um, were intoler were not prepared to tolerate um, these kinds of practices. So there emerged then a very unexpected rival in the person of James J. Strang. So Strang of the Wisconsin Territory is actually a relatively new member. He was baptized by Joseph Smith in February of 1844, so just a few months before Joseph Smith uh, was killed. He wasn't on that Council of 50. He didn't have any um, church headquarters leadership role. He wasn't living at church headquarters. Nevertheless, um, what Strang did claim uh, was two things that Young lacked. And the first was he claimed that he had a canonical legal claim to the succession. And the second, um, which I think is the more important one, is that he had a divine claim, he said, via angelic ordination and then prophetic gifts uh, that the Latter-day Saints of the time had been coming to expect from their leader. So uh, the first portion of this uh, was this idea uh, that Strang um, proposed anyway, that he had had a letter mailed to him by Joseph Smith, and not only does uh, Strang claim that it was by jo from Joseph Smith, but rather, but that also that uh, his interpretation of it was that it was appointing him to be Joseph Smith's successor. So um, the church's uh, law and rules that are found in the book of Doctrine and Covenants, they say nothing at all about ex apostles succeeding to the role of church president. So it doesn't say when the prophet dies, the senior most member of the Council of Apostles becomes the new church president. That's not anywhere in scripture. That doesn't have any any kind of uh, uh, canonical precedent, um, but instead, um, anyway, but that is what has de happened de facto in, just, in Brigham Young's um, in rule and in his that of his successors, but it doesn't actually canonical anywhere. It does say, however, that if Joseph Smith was going to fall, he would have no power save it be to appoint a successor. And so Strang claimed to have been appointed Smith's successor via this letter dated June 19th, 1844, that called upon Strang to build up a stake of Zion called Voree in the Wisconsin Territory. Um, so this is an argument. This has not been this has not been very persuasive to people who aren't Strangites. Um, certainly, uh, uh, people who are in the other churches, um, scholars looked at it, and they do not find this to any be in Joseph Smith's hand, it's certainly not his signature, um, and that's not been identified as a scribe of his or, or, or any of those things. Um, I'm gonna suggest that more importantly to a lot of the members, 
uh, at the time is that Strang claimed that at the moment of Joseph Smith's martyrdom, so the moment that he was killed by the mob, an angel appeared to him, to Strang, and ordained him to be prophet, seer, revelator, and translator for the church. So the report of angelic visions begins a whole series of ways that Strang's ministry mirrored that of Joseph Smith. So from that first um, calling and appointment and ordination by an angel, next was his discovery, and along with formal witnesses, recovery and translation of records engraved on metal plates. So that happens soon after. So um, this is a facsimile of the three plates in Voree in Wisconsin. Uh, it's called the Voree plates. Strang reported on September the 1st, 1845, an angel of God appeared to him and showed him the location, quote, the location of, quote, the record of my people in whose possession thou dwellest. And on September 13th, Strang led four witnesses to a large oak on a hill in Voree, known as the Hill of Promise. And you could still go to Voree to the Hill of Promise and see where this was and invited them to examine the ground around the tree carefully before digging for the plates where he told them where the angel said they were buried. They um, uh, dug it up. They found a tiny little set of metal plates that have these engravings on them, including you can see all of this little uh, the language and also some pictures here. And so uh, Strang then um, took the text and translated it and published his translation, which he says is this, the record of Raja Manchu of Vorito. Uh, and it reads, my people are no more. The mighty are fallen and the young slain in battle. Their bones bleached on the plain by the noonday shadow. The houses are leveled to the dust and in the moat are the walls. They shall be inhabited. I have in the burial served them and their bones in the death shade towards the sun rising are covered. They sleep with the mighty dead and they rest with their fathers. They have fallen in transgression and are not, but the elect and faithful there shall dwell. The word hath revealed it. God has sworn to give an inheritance to his people where transgressors perished. The word of God came to me while I mourned in the death shade saying, I will avenge me on the destroyer. He shall be driven out other strangers shall inhabit thy land an ensign there will be set up the escaped of my people there shall dwell when the flock disown the shepherd and build not on the rock the forerunner men shall kill but a mighty prophet there shall dwell i will be his strength and he shall bring forth thy record record my words and bury it in the hill of promise so as you can kind of see here the plates um then predict uh, they're talking about an ancient people that are dwelling there of natives who have been uh, uh, had battle and are, are, are killed but nevertheless through uh, revelation and prophecy this ancient prophet uh, has uh, seen that a forerunner joseph smith will be killed and a mighty prophet though uh, will gather people to vori uh, and so it's a prophecy here that is foreseeing um, the kind of succession crisis uh, and Strang's own ministry. Okay, so by contrast to um, the golden plates, uh, which are the uh, idea or the source of the Book of Mormon, um, in fact, even though they have a lot of paintings like this, no one actually ever saw mm -hmm. Joseph Smith's plates, the golden plates with their physical eyes. They would have always been covered by the cloth or in a box. Generally speaking, during the um, dictation process, they're said to be in a box off in the woods. They're not used because the, um, uh, the dictation is done by channeling, spiritual channeling, not by looking at, uh, at the ancient texts. Um, this is completely not the case for the, the Vori plates. So the Vori plates, there's a physical artifact and we can be quite sure of it because of how many um, uh, non-Mormons uh, saw them and examined them. So one of just many of these is a guy named Christopher Latham Scholes, who was the editor of the Southport Telegraph. So Southport is now called Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, and this is this very same guy who actually invented um, 
the QWERTY keyboard. And so if you look at your computer keyboard and it says QWERTY, <laughs> you know, and in terms of that organization, um, you know, this is the guy who uh, created that kind of typewriter. So he writes, the Vori plates, the wonder of many, I saw them and the place from whence they were taken. They are about one inch and a half by two and three fourths, thickly covered with ancient char characters of curious workmanship. Um, and so very, these are very, it's a very interesting artifact. We don't have the, the plates, they have been, uh, the artifact has been lost, but we do have uh, published facsimiles of them. And just very interestingly, um, as these have been, uh, we worked on decipherments of them. And there have been several people in before me who have worked out some of the decipherment and I've gone through and done a little bit more of it. And it does turn out uh, that all of these characters, in fact, actually match up with the translation. So this is not simply um, gobbledygook little figures that are written. There is actually um, a non-English cipher or um, you know, not you know, using different alphabets here um, that also includes um, uh, a little bit of a little bit of Hebrew where it gets to this word. Uh, death, the death shade twice. And so because of the way we can see, um, you know, the repeated words, um, we can see that how these all line up. And it's very interesting that the, um, the plates are actually also written, the characters are written, uh, not, you know, how, so, you know, you know, we read left to right, and Hebrew is read right to left. Um, but the plates here, the Vori plates are actually written in Bustrophidon. <laughs> which is a, an ancient way that when people, before they decided to go left to right or right, right to left, in this case, what it does is it goes uh, right to left, left to right, right to left, left to right. So it's going back and forth line after line. And it's very interesting anyway, that it has actually been uh, written out that way. So there's an actual, uh, anyway, non-English characters, a non-English language, and, and also, um, uh, anyway, an interesting, uh, knowledge of how ancient texts work so um that was a, that was impressive <laughs> they didn't even they didn't know that decipherment that's been done more recently uh, even without being able to look at it that closely under the magnifying glass lots of the early members found this to be quite a, an amazing thing and it was very much in keeping with um, their understanding of the kind of things that joseph smith had been doing um, there was at the time uh, in the 18 43 Nauvoo hymnal, a hymn that began, a church without a prophet is not a church for me. And so many of the members uh, were dissatisfied with the church led by apostles. Um, they had been pretty much bought into um, following Joseph Smith around as a prophet who was giving them teaching, new teachings and new revelations. And they were impressed enough by Strang's claim to the prophetic mantle that they joined his organization. And so many of these gathered to Vori, including Joseph Smith's um, only surviving uh, brother, William Smith, uh, who went and located there and was recognized by Strang as the presiding patriarch of the church. So um, prominent members who at least briefly sided with Strang included William Marks, who had been president of the presiding high council of the church, William Smith, who had been the presiding patriarch, Lucy Mack Smith, who had Joseph Smith's mother, um, witnesses of the Book of Mormon, including Martin Harris, David Whitmer, John Whitmer, uh, the apostles John E. Page and William McClellan, and former first presidency member and former mayor of Nauvoo, uh, John C. Bennett, who had been also a a notorious, uh, notoriously broke with Joseph Smith. So he also a, was also a renegade too, uh, but nevertheless quite prominent at a certain point in, in Nauvoo. And, uh, and also the presiding bishop, uh, George Miller. So it's a lot of important, impressive uh, people in the hierarchy who were at least temporarily convinced and uh, joined with Strang. Um, so no matter how much um, Brigham Young would have liked to have simply dismissed this new challenge the way he did Rigdon, um, these successes actually were pretty alarming. 
um, in an example in the Mormon settlement of Norway, Illinois, um, which is actually where my great, 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 great grandparents on one of the lines lived, um, Brigham Young um, sent as um, the missionary Reuben Miller, he had been a Brigham Young supporter, uh, to debate Strang. Um, and then as a result of this debate, um, Reuben Miller had actually converted all these Norwegians to become Mormon in the first place. Uh, he had been the leader. He debates Strang as to who should be the, who the true successor was. Not only did Strang uh, win the debate, he convinced Reuben Miller and everybody in the whole uh, town of Norway all, uh, all joined and became Strangites. And in fact, the leader of the settlement became uh, one of Strang's apostles. Um, the only people, the only leaders that weren't there, my, my great, 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 great grandparents were, uh, they were off in Nauvoo and they didn't hear the debate. They got back and everybody says, hey, we're all Strangites now. And he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so anyway, so my, my ancestors didn't actually join with the Strangites at that point, but they're all their friends did. Um, also, Strang went, had a similar kind of thing happen in Kirtland and was able to gain p possession of the Kirtland Temple for a time and gathered all of the kind of old uh, members who had uh, left the church there and he refounded a stake of the church there in Kirtland. So um, as a result here, then there's these different major gathering centers. Um, and as now, um, we kind of are seeing this movement of the church, as I said before, from uh, New York to Ohio to Missouri to Illinois and now from Illinois um, as Brigham Young uh, is fleeing for the West, fleeing, fleeing across Iowa and Nebraska, um, there is this rival that is emerging still in the Midwest in Voree, uh, Wisconsin. Okay, so looking for land. Um, so as Brigham Young took his followers west to Utah, um, Strang looked north uh, to Beaver Island. So the frontier we have to think about with the U.S. as being um, going from east to west, but it also was going from kind of the middle of the country north as well um, as settlers were going further into these kind of lands that had been largely just uh, where the natives had been or trappers and that kind of a thing. And so there's a heavily wooded island um, that had been seasonably, seen as seasonally inhabited by fur traders, fishermen, and occasional native hunters, uh, the largest island, as I've mentioned, in Lake Michigan. Um, Mormon settlers were able to squat on government land for free, and they could cut timber uh, as cordwood to passing steamboats. And eventually 3,000 more or more of Strang's followers moved to Beaver Island and the surrounding uh, islands. And so to think of this kind of uh, economy, but the, the Great Lakes were being uh, traveled all the time by all of these kind of, you know, steamboats, like the steamboats that are up and down the Mississippi and Ohio and uh, Missouri rivers, and uh, they needed a lot of wood. And so people could just make money by cutting down all the wood on the island and bringing it out to selling it to the steamboats. Okay. Um, Polygamy um, had been one of these uh, central issues that was dividing early Mormonism. So I mentioned that um, part of the issue in the initial succession between uh, Sidney Rigdon and Brigham Young was that um, Emma Smith and, and um, Sidney Rigdon and, uh, and, and William, anyway, several other people uh, at, you know, in that kind of time period were very much opponents of polygamy, whereas Brigham Young and uh, the apostles were secretly practicing it. And so um, um, Brigham Young was prominently involved in its covert practice at Nauvoo. So uh, Joseph Smith was publicly um, denying polygamy. And as a result of that, people who were not in the inner circles in Nauvoo believed uh, that he, you know, he was very much opposed to it. And so Strang, who hadn't been um, part of the inner circles, who was part of the, the church out in the branches, um, was initially a very eloquent opponent of polygamy. But all of that changed course uh, in 1849 uh, when he married Elvira Field, uh, which is the first of four plural wives in addition to uh, his legal wife. So he already was married when this occurred. And we actually have here a picture of Elvira um, when she was um, dressing here, uh, pretending to be a, a young man, Charles Douglas, and passing as, uh, as Strang's secretary. 
And so he was going around to different church conferences with a kind of a young uh, teenager secretary who was supposedly uh, a boy, <laughs> and it was in fact actually uh, a, a woman. And that ended up causing a little bit of a, a scandal when people kind of realized that uh, what was going on. Um, another thing that ends up happening is uh, that there's trouble with neighbors. Um, Mormons had found that we've seen this kind of uh, geographic movement. So in the same way that there was trouble with the neighbors in New York and in Ohio and in Missouri and in Illinois that caused uh, uh, the Mormons to have to abandon their different settlements, um, the same kind of thing happened in uh, Beaver Island. So the Mormon settlements on Beaver Island were seen as kind of dangerous competition for the much older settlements on Mackinac Island. So Mackinac Island, if you could go up there still, it's a, a cute um, tourist destination with this grand hotel um, and, and this kind of a thing from anyway, having been settled hundreds and hundreds of, of years ago. But by the time um, uh, Beaver Island, the kingdom on Beaver Island gets going, uh, most of the easy woods on the island, you can see it's wooded again nowadays, but it had all been cut down. And so the people on Mackinac Island weren't able to uh, easily sell wood to the steamships who maybe just as easily now skip Mackinac Island and go directly to Beaver Island where they can get their cheaper uh, cordwood. So um, the people on Mackinac Island didn't like this rivalry and there's a bunch of other reasons why, uh, political reasons and also um, for example, uh, the monopoly on dealing with uh, natives and uh, being able to uh, intercept uh, subsidies that the U.S. federal government was going to was giving to natives and other kinds of different trading that was happening. Um, so as a result of it, the Mackinac Islanders were really quite opposed to uh, the Mormon colony on Beaver Island. Uh, the U.S. president, actually, President Millard Fillmore, directed the USS Michigan, which is uh, a warship, a Navy ship in the Great Lakes, to go to Beaver Island to arrest Strang and his lieutenants and to bring them to trial in Detroit for trespassing. So they were living on Beaver Island, um, squatting on government owned land. They didn't actually own the land, but they were uh, colonizing it. Um, and after this big trial of the century kind of thing, um, Strang, who is actually really quite a brilliant uh, speaker and a a uh, pretty good lawyer, <laughs> you know, actually was able to um, uh, have himself acquitted. So uh, as the Conneaut reporter reports, uh, a great ado has been made over the arrest of Strang, the Mormon king at Beaver Island, alleging that he had been guilty of almost everything. He has had an examination at Detroit and has been honorably acquitted. In this case, we are of the opinion that Strang and his followers have been wronged. So it was also a, uh, a, a amazing PR success story. And as a result of this, it made it a lot harder um, to try it again, even though the people in Mackinac were still really quite upset. So um, once this kind of happened, um, having been acquitted uh, of, from this trial, Strang was then able to use uh, his political capital to win election to the Michigan State Legislature in 1853. Um, and so this was accomplished by um, kind of Mormon block voting. So when all of the Mormons all vote to the same way, then he got more votes than anybody else. And he became then a legislator. And actually he was quite respected as a legislator. And he became one of the most senior members the following term um, when the newly founded Republican Party swept into power. So everybody who had been in the Michigan State Legislature, um, they got turned out, the whole Democratic Party did, and suddenly there's all these Republicans and they're all brand new legislators, except for Strang because he didn't have any trouble getting reelected because all his own people just voted for him. So he became a very senior member of the legislature as a result of that. Um, other interesting things that are going on. Uh, one of the things that I find to be absolutely fascinating about James Strang, so we looked at how the, um, the Vori plates are actually very, um, very clever. <laughs> There is a, a, an idea there that um, is very sophisticated when you're looking at the, there's an actual language and uh, characters that are, are present in the translation. Um, and other things that are occurring uh, that Strang was doing was fixing some of Joseph Smith's, what I think of as unfinished theology. So in his final years, um, Joseph Smith had been engaging in a kind of new theological speculation about the nature of God. Um, as he retold his um, 
his memory of his first vision that's occurred when he was a teenager, he um, in later versions of that um, recalls that there are two identical looking personages identified as Heavenly Father and as Christ. So seeing the two personages quite distinct uh, from each other. And Joseph Smith ultimately came to believe in the 1840s that human beings were literal children of uh, Heavenly Father and ultimately that they could become like him. So that uh, in an earlier aeon and in an earlier world, uh, God, the Heavenly Father, who is a distinct physical personage from uh, Jesus Christ, had in fact lived life as a human being and now had become an exalted being and God, and that ultimately it's the destiny of uh, the righteous um, you know, priesthood holders and things like jo people like Joseph Smith to be uh, become like God in that sense in the future. So, um, so part of how some of this is how does this even work, right? So Smith's uncanonized speculation that men could become exalted as gods and that the Godhead consisted of multiple gods that were once mortal men. This essentially rejects um, the entire Western tradition of monism and monotheism. So as um, Joseph Smith's successors attempted to reason out the consequences, um, Brigham Young, for example, ended up teaching a doctrine that Adam, uh, the, the scriptural um, uh, character in the beginning of Genesis, um, that that had been a historical personage, and in fact that Adam is God. Um, and that is a, 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 one of his few doctrinal innovations himself, and it's a doctrine that, uh, that his church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, later rejected after Brigham Young's death, although he was quite serious about it. Um, there's a lot of uh, fundamentalist Mormons who are not part of the, the tr central church structure who have maintained uh, Brigham Young's teaching, uh, this Adam-God doctrine. Okay, Strang had a different idea that I think makes more sense. I think one of the reasons why um, the Mormon church in Utah rejected the Adam-God doctrine is because it's crazy, you know, I don't know, it's harder to, to square uh, and it's harder to get your hands around. Um, but Strang's addition to Smith's ideas about exaltation, I think, solve a core, solves a core problem. So Strang actually um, rejects this idea that God had once been a, a human being or something like that. He instead thought that God was and remained infinite all, and almighty. So that retains um, this tradition of monotheism that's kind of the core of um, Western theology, Western civilization, Christianity. Um, but uh, he does explain instead um, that it's Jesus who began life as a mortal and then became exalted as a god, with small g, so not the god, not god in the monotheist sense, but as an exalted uh, divine being, a god, and is therefore the model for human exaltation. And so um, this is a rejection um, not of monotheism, um, as in Utah Mormonism, but is a rejection of, um, of, of Trinitarianism. And so it's going back to a, uh, a Christology that is found in among early Christians, some different uh, heterodox teachings of early Christian groups that was called adoptionism, this idea that um, uh, Jesus is essentially adopted as God's uh, begotten son, that there's one God, but Jesus uh, essentially is a, becomes a divine person in a uh, anyway that is adopted. Um, okay, so one of the things um, that Strang also did was kind of finish up some of these ideas um, that, as I mentioned, Sidney Rigdon and Joseph Smith had had where they were going from being New Testament primitivists to bringing in a lot of Old Testament stuff, but without, um, without figuring out exactly how it all works. In some sense, the uh, Christian understanding of the New Testament is that um, the New Testament requires that we reject a bunch of Old Testament legalism and that we're not in fact subject to this kind of, uh, to these Old Testament laws as Christians. Um, Strang uh, 
takes that a very different way. So his last uh, great work was a new book of scripture called The Book of the Law of the Lord. And so Strang um, says that he translated this um, book, this uh, from a book that had been written on brass plates and the law of Moses. And so this is a um, this is an a, a ancient work, the brass plates that's mentioned in the Book of Mormon. So in some sense, it's a um, it's a built off or a sequel to the Book of Mormon. But in some sense, it's also a way where you bring um, Old Testament uh, uh, Israelitism into and make it totally uh, fitting it as far as Trang is concerned uh, with a kind of a Mormon New Testament Christianity. And so anyway, as a result of this, uh, Strangites um, recognize, uh, you know, then keep the Sabbath day holy. And the Sabbath is actually, uh, despite the fact that Christians sometimes call Sunday the Sabbath, Sunday is the Lord's day, the Sabbath is Saturday. Uh, and so Strangites actually, because of the book of the law of the Lord, um, don't celebrate uh, the Lord's day. They don't celebrate the Christian um, Sunday. And instead, they are Seventh-day Sabbatarians, so they have church on Saturday. Um, they also, um, the Book of the Law of the Lord also includes a revision and an expansion of the Ten Commandments that is said, in Frank's understanding anyway, that, that restores, uh, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So this um, great commandment of Jesus as the fourth commandment uh, of the Ten Commandments. So it fixes the Ten Commandments to make them, to Christianize them, to make them Christian. Okay, so one last way um, that Strang's um, life mirrors and reiterates Joseph Smith's is in the, in, in the martyrdom. And so on June 16, 1856, uh, a party of conspirators who were protected by the USS Michigan Navy ship come to Beaver Island. Uh, they summon Strang, who walks down and, and uh, to, to visit with them, and they, and they shoot him. Um, he is mortally wounded, and he dies a month later on July 9th. Um, and so with that, um, there is then a scattering of the Strangites and an end of the kingdom. So later, all of the folks on Mackinac Island, they rent uh, steamships, they come and with guns and they force all of the uh, Mormons that are on Beaver Island to gather all of their possessions. They, they then relieve them of their possessions. They herd them all onto the steamboats and they drop them off all around the edges of, of Lake Michigan, scattering everybody uh, so that it makes them extremely hard to regroup. They've not only lost all their possessions, their farm, everything, they're um, split up into tiny groups that are preventing them from, uh, from reforming. Um, and actually what ends up happening uh, uh, largely is uh, when a few years later, uh, uh, Joseph Smith's son, Joseph Smith III, emerges at the head of what was called the reorganization of the church, what becomes Community of Christ, the majority of Strangites um, accept him as the prophet and become um, members of that tradition. And indeed, um, two of our regulars who watch our lectures, um, uh, Tiona and Eliza, who maybe are watching right now, um, they are actually, I think it's Strang as their great, 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 great grandfather. So they are descendants of, of Strang himself. So we'll do a shout out to them. Um, hopefully they're watching and enjoying it. It's neat to have um, uh, Strang descendants among us. Um, and so, um, anyway, yeah. a small... Through Elvira Field. Through Elvira Field. Oh, really cool, yeah. So it's very, very interesting, right? <laughs> and so, um, uh, anyway, there has been, though, um, a small group of Strangites, Mormons, who have continued to maintain themselves in a very... Um, it's one functionally been one congregation uh, occasionally, there's a couple congregations that are in different places, uh, but it has largely been sustainable all of this time since the 1850s, and they're doing really quite well, I think, right now. Um, and so the very last active Strangite Mormon congregation is in Burlington, Wisconsin, in Vori, that, um, that original settlement. And this is a picture of their church, and they're really the, the nicest people. 
Um, we spent a lot of time in their church and their archives doing research with them and doing oral uh, oral histories and interviews and um, just wonderful, wonderful people. And so um, that's my brief take on the uh, history of James J. Strang and the Mormon kingdom on Beaver Island. Um, there's plenty more to this story if you're finding it interesting. My friend uh, Vicki Speak um, has written the main book on the topic um, and it's called God Has Made Us a Kingdom, James Strang and the Great Lakes Mormons. And so um, I definitely recommend Vicki's book if you would want to learn more about Strang and uh, his his wives and his his people uh, thereafter. So um, were there other questions, Leandro, that we have? On... Yes. Okay, cool. Um, I'm not sure, you're gonna have to repeat the question. Okay, yeah, I'll repeat it. The, even Charlie, whom we saw yesterday. Oh, okay. Was the Nebu ex expositor burn over the king ordination or because of polygamy? So yeah, the question is, was the that newspaper, that opposition newspaper I talked about in Nauvoo, uh, the Nauvoo expositor, was it um, destroyed because it was talking about polygamy or was it because it was going to expose um, this the secret ordination of the of the Council of Fifty and, and all of the secret kingdom stuff? Um, and so it isn't entirely clear. They're not saying we're doing it to prevent them from telling, you know, revealing our secret of the kingdom because they don't want to talk about that secret. So they don't want to know about it. Um, the, the secret of polygamy, though, was not a secret. Everybody knew about that. That had been very widely published. We mentioned um, John C. Bennett, um, who later became, um, a, you know, one of the parts of Strang's first presidency. Well, he'd been in the first presidency. Uh, under Joseph Smith, and he'd been the mayor of Nauvoo and so on. He had spent two years um, traveling all around the country with this vast expose where he was constantly talking about the secrets, practices of polygamy. Um, the, the neighboring newspaper in, uh, in Warsaw, Illinois, um, uh, was publishing just very detailed, um, they, they, they were very well informed about the, the details. The secret wasn't very secret. Um, so, so I guess I'm kind of persuaded that that wasn't the, the scary part for Joseph Smith, um, but they, um, the, the first issue of the expositor that went out talked about how um, uh, that they were gonna reveal stuff about secret meetings that had been held and people realized uh, that, that somebody on the Council of 50 had talked and had leaked that information. And so I think that they were m moving uh, to prevent that from being printed in a second issue. Uh, and so actually William Law, who was the publisher of the, um, uh, of the paper, he couldn't even believe when that, when it had been destroyed. He says, he says afterwards, he says he couldn't believe, um, anybody could be that stupid politically to have done it because it meant that there, there, there was going to be no way to make peace because the freedom of the press, uh, the First Amendment, uh, separation of church and state and everything like that was so um, jealously guarded at the time um, in American values that uh, the destruction of the press really led to uh, the destruction of the Nauvoo Kingdom. Uh, Nathan Gale is asking if other Christian denominations have also flirted with theocracy from this concept of the kingdom of God. So uh, Nathan is asking, are there other Christian denominations that have um, flirted with theocracy of establishing kingdom of God with an actual king of the kingdom of heaven on earth in that sense, which I, I think the king part is um, unusual. <laughs> so um, I mean, throughout, uh, so from, from the time period when uh, Christianity becomes the state religion of the Roman empire, uh, Christianity is, uh, and the Roman Empire is a theocracy, um, and the and the king is the emperor, the Caesar, has become now the the king appointed by God. And if you look at all of the, and that's true all the way down through the, the Middle Ages, when we have instead of emperors, we have mostly we have kings of the different kingdoms, the king of France, the king of of England, and so on. And if you look at the imagery. Um, of Christ in that kind of time period in antiquity and the medieval time period, we're not, we don't have um, the kind of modern Renaissance um, um, 
imagery of like the Catholic imagery now, modern Catholic imagery of Christ on the cross, the suffering Christ and all of those kind of things, or maybe the more modern um, romantic um, imagery of, you know, we, we maybe want of Christ um, living among the poor, being poor, or hanging out with the poor and that kind of thing. Um, these are these are exalted images of Christ as emperor. <laughs> you know, so Christ is sitting on a throne. Christ is dressed in the imperial regalia. Um, and so it is this um, direct idea that the king um, of England or the Holy Roman Emperor is in fact the kind of um, stand-in for God on earth. And so I do think that there has been that central sense of a kind of a, a theocracy through the bulk of Christian history. And then, um, then obviously the, uh, with the weakening of, of monarchies, so monarchies have become constitutional and, and indeed um, Christianity is not isn't what it once was either in terms of being and having control over uh, people's uh, lives and that kind of a thing um, that's lessened and so then uh, the idea then is we, there are small movements um, that will happen like like early Mormonism where you will get a uh, charismatic leader um, that charismatic leader may well have all kinds of um, pretensions that you know where where they are they're functionally creating a little mini theocracy in the form of a in the form of a cult and really that's kind of what Nauvoo had gotten to at that point um, it has survived and it's gone you know the movements have survived and so that's not the case for uh, the different successor churches um, including the Strangheights and the Community of Christ and the LDS Church which are um, have have moved on institutionally they're hundreds of years old and so therefore are not in in that place anymore um, but I would say it is a thing that can, can happen in any, you know, there isn't always separation of church and state, so it can happen. Uh, Jody Wilson, was James Strang and those who followed him ever in Fredericksburg? So Jody is asking, was James Strang ever in Fredericksburg, in Fredericksburg is Maryland? Is that where we're? I will ask uh, Nick for a confirmation. <laughs> Even uh, is asking, um, do you know what the string guy's relationship to the Book of Mormon and the inspired version and also the Book of Abraham is? So uh, even as asking, so what are the um, standard works of the Strangites? And so um, so the Strangites under recognize as uh, scripture, the uh, you know, the Bible, um, they do not have the inspired version as as is called in the in the community of christ because community of christ actually um first you know uh, published that in the 1860s and so that's after um so emma had those notes um and she didn't give them to anybody until uh, her son is leading a church in the 1860s and that's when the joseph smith bible revision the inspired version um is known and so that's when um that becomes a part of the canon in community of Christ, the um, uh, the doctrine and covenants, uh, the Book of Mormon and doctrine and covenants are also um, uh, part of the Strangite canon, as is the Book of the Law of the Lord that I mentioned. So those would be like the the four books of Scripture, uh, but Strangites are also um, very. Uh, they're very interested in text. And so, and so for them, they have only had the two prophets. So there was Joseph Smith and there was James Strang. And so what's incredibly important to the Strangites in terms of doctrine and teaching is anything that was published um, by, uh, in the time period of Joseph Smith, by the church in the time period of Joseph Smith and James Strang. And there's actually a lot of stuff because in addition to, um, uh, that those canon of scriptures that we just mentioned, there's all of the different church newspapers. And so that's, you know, the Messenger and Advocate, the Elders Journal, the, the Times and Seasons, the, uh, and then the different James Strang newspapers, so the Gospel Herald, the Vori Herald, and the Northern Irelander. And so as a result, all of those contain um, uh, teachings that are all valid and, and can functionally be like scripture for the Strangites. And so the Strangites are, are pretty clear. So like in the, in the Utah church, um, there's a section of the Book of Mormon and you read it and you pray about it. And if you feel good and if you have a, 
strong feeling that's said to be feeling the spirit and then that teaches you that the book of mormon is a true record and that the prophet's true and all this kind of thing the strangites when you ask them talking about that they'll say no 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 that is not the way that works you're just getting a good feeling that's wonderful but the way you understand whether something is is doctrine or not is whether it is consistent uh, among the things that have been published and that are already in the text you can be deceived by feelings and you have to um, instead be um, study very strongly the actual texts in texas oh texas fredericksburg okay yeah no i know what you're talking about um so no strang did not go down there um but that's where the the whiteites were right and so lyman white um has another that so the strangites so the str most successful colonies uh, are taking place with Brigham Young out in Utah. The second most successful is James Strang and his colonies up in northern Michigan and, and Wisconsin. And then the third most successful are Lyman Whites down in Texas, Fredericksburg and everything. Yeah, of course. And so, um, and so whereas, um, uh, whereas Strang didn't ever go down there, um, nevertheless, uh, one person who did go down there was, uh, was Bishop uh, George Miller, who was the presiding bishop of the church. George Miller is one of the two main scouts uh, who's with Brigham Young, and they, he actually leads the people across Iowa. They get to Council Bluffs. Uh, when, when Brigham Young says, okay, now I'm going to be the prophet, I'm going to have a new first presidency, um, he loses uh, Bishop Miller, who, didn't, who believed that the next prophet should be Joseph III. And so, so Bishop Miller leaves him. He goes down uh, with to Lyman White's colony and is hanging out there. Uh, ultimately, um, he and Lyman White don't get along either. And so then he, uh, Bishop Miller moves to Beaver Island and becomes a Strangite. Um, he then ultimately doesn't get along with Strang either. But anyway, in any event, there there is connections between the Strangites and the Whiteites there. And then the other connection is that um, in the same way that James Strang uh, predicted that, so Joseph Smith predicted that Joseph III would ultimately be a uh, prophet of the church. James Strang also prophesied that Joseph III would be a uh, prophet of the church and also Lyman White felt the same. So Lyman White was present at many of the blessings where, um, where Joseph Smith gave a special blessing um, on, on uh, Joseph III's head that that was gonna happen. And so as a result, uh, Lyman White never wanted to be the leader of the church. He always felt that Joseph III was gonna be the leader. And so as a result of that, almost all the Whiteites um, ended up being joining in the reorganization in the same way that almost all the Strangites ended up in the reorganization. And so that's, uh, that's the thing that they have in common between Fredericksburg, Texas and uh, Beaver Island. that Strang used to restore or update the Ten Commandments come from? Come from um, yeah. So the, there's two sets of plates and people get quite... Can you repeat the question? Oh yeah, here's the question. So there, so there we... Um, so James... Well, the question's about James Strang's plates. And so so I mentioned and I, and I kind of uh, gave you a facsimile and talked a lot about the first little set of plates which are called the Voree plates. These are plates where there was an actual artifact that people saw that we have a facsimile of um, uh, and we have the translation of and I've been able to even work on the decipherment of. But there's a much bigger um, group of plates, the brass plates, which are, like I say, it's a, it's a t text that's mentioned in the Book of Mormon. So the plates of brass are this plates that Nephi has to go back to Jerusalem to get from his relative Laban. Uh, and so that's the plates that James Strang then says that he gets a hold of and translates and makes into the book of the law of the Lord, this fourth book of scripture uh, for the Strangite Mormons. Um, I, so that's part of it is, it's way less clear. So we know, I know an awful lot about where we get the Vori plates and what they looked like and everything like that. It's a lot more hazy um, where the brass plates are coming from and who all the witnesses of the brass plates are and, um, and, and again, I don't have a facsimile of those. And so I would like to see that because I think that that would be very, very uh, interesting if that were to come to light. I haven't seen that um, published. And so I'm not sure that it's it's totally known, but in any event, um, I'm, I'm not as aware of where they're coming from, but we should just make the distinction that they are, um, they're different and that ultimately the, the brass plates are actually coming from the Book of Mormon. That's where they're referenced.
sure if you may have already answered this question from Leon. Um, uh, he's asking about the plays. Oh, well, a lot of questions about the plays here. Let, let me let me track Leon. Okay. Um, if he he wants to know if the Let's see if I got the book of the law for up here. I do. It's right here. So book, book. this is the book of the law of the Lord. <laughs> Anyway, so this is the translation anyway from the brass plates. I don't have the, it doesn't, it's not published with a, with a facsimile or anything like that. But anyway. Okay, Leon is asking if anyone ever saw the brass plates and whether the Vorey plates disappeared. So, so the Vorey plates um, disappeared. So they were uh, last in the possession, last known to be in the possession of one of Strang's widows. So she had moved to um, the town next to Lamoni, Iowa, which was where the headquarters of the reorganization was, but she was not in that. Um, she wasn't part of the reorganization, but um, anyway, it was a part that's where she was. And, and she was the last person known to have had them. There's conspiracy theories or rumors or whatever of who might have grabbed them from her or something, but they were ultimately lost. And so that artifact is, uh, was known to exist after um, the death of Strang and Beaver Island, but it's now gone. But we do have facsimiles, so we can look at it pretty closely without. Um, uh, in terms of the brass plates, like I say, I've never seen, I've got the I'm, I have the translation and everything, but I did not seen the um, uh, facsimile or anything like that. And I also don't have, uh, you know, a sense of, anyway, I, I, anywhere near as much of the, the story around when Strang got a hold of brass plates and that kind of a thing. Uh, as I do for the Vori plates, so I don't know. Um, Ivan uh, is asking, what is the question about? If um, the, you mentioned adoptionism. Yes, adoptionism. Okay. Did R RLDS, um, the, the RLDS church, incorporate any strang I beliefs? So, does the RLDS church incorporate any strang I beliefs? Um, so, the RLDS church had to contend a lot with Strang I beliefs because so many of the people who came into the RLDS church um, had been Strangites. And so there's actually, uh, I think it's been like from the 1870s, very early, or 1880s, very early um, Herald House book, which is Herald House is the Community of Christ Press, um, that is why, uh, why uh, Sunday is the Lord's day <laughs> you know in other words why why are we not seventh day sabbatarians and so why do they have to why do they have to have a big long polemical argument against seventh day sabbatarianism well it's because there's a lot of people who had been um, convinced by um by strang that the sabbath is saturday which it is by the way he's right <laughs> so but the point of it is actually uh in christian understanding people don't really aware of this you know like augustine said you know should should christians be following the ten commandments no no, because we're not we're we're because we're not supposed to worship on Saturday because we, the Jesus is a fulfillment of those. So uh, so the but anyway so the Sabbath is Saturday and if you don't speak English, a lot of other languages you know Saturday they, don't, they it's called essentially Sabbath or Sabato or anything like that. Uh, but in English people were kind of had spent a bunch of time calling Sunday the Sabbath and thinking that that's one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, and it, so anyway there had to be a. Uh, um, a lot of argument against that. I would say um, I'm not aware of any particular Strangite teaching that makes it into um, Community of Christ that con has continued to this day. Um, essentially, the goal that Joseph Smith the Third had was to kind of um, go back to a kind of a Kirtland era uh, restorationism, which is something that maybe everybody could agree to, so that. Uh, you don't have to worry about all the things that the Whiteites are doing off in Texas or the Thompsonites are doing in Iowa or the uh, the Strangites have been doing up in, in Michigan. And instead, um, we can, the Williamites in Illinois, and instead we can kind of all go back to that time period in Kirtland when we all sang the Spirit of God like a fire is burning together and we had this thing that actually... Um, we actually finished a temple and it worked out and that kind of a thing. So that ended up being, I think, the um, uh, what Joseph the uh, Third was kind of trying to knit together all of these kind of disparate groups by doing. And so therefore, it kind of rejects most of the innovations that would have happened in the 
and the different successor periods as a result of that. Okay, we're, we're going to have to, uh, no more questions. I, ha I don't have a lot of questions in the queue. Okay. Uh, no, we have to, no, no, we can't take any more questions? No, no more questions. No. Okay, um, Mike, Leandro's not going to let me have any more questions. <laughs> I'm glad you guys have a lot of questions. I, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. We, can, we can answer the questions later. Yeah, we can answer questions later. Okay. All right, but anyway. But, so. But I, Oh, don't add any more questions. I'm gonna answer. I'm gonna answer. Okay, I get it. So, so. Okay, we're gonna answer a few more. Good. I'm happy. <laughs> I'm glad that you guys are finding this topic interesting. I find it to be endlessly fascinating. I just think it's. I need to catch up. Um, first of all, even ask where where can you get that book? The this one. Showing. The book of the Law of the Lord or yeah. Vicky's book? No, no, that one. The, the this one book. you have to um, you have to get it from the Strangites in Forey. So uh, we will find a, a website or the, the, the website for the Strangite Church. Um, it's the one that's in in Vori. They've got a long domain name that I don't remember what it is, but we'll put a link up. Uh, Dion, any Strangite contemporaries hear him mention the angel visit in 1844 before the news assassination would have come through post or print? So yeah, does is there anybody that he announced that to? And we don't have there. We don't have that. That would have been really you know another piece of uh, amazing. The other question is you know so he he has this angelic ordination um, that would have been chronologically simultaneous to Joseph Smith being assassinated. But if he, if he had announced that then to everybody and he'd gone to uh, Charles Latham or whatever the guy's name of the courty fame and he'd actually printed that and said i can att i can attest to you right now this day joseph smith has been shot that would be that, that news would have been printed in the newspaper in wisconsin before anybody could get the news you know because they don't they don't have satellite or anything like that and so that would have been pretty impressive uh we do not have anything like that so that didn't um that's not one of the things so uh, in terms of the chronological claim um it it surfaces after after the fact uh and so it's only on strang's word that we would have it that it took place at that time okay question from claire shepherdson john the fly leaf in the front of the book of mormon tells of the three witnesses and the eight witnesses yes you said no one ever saw these plates yes what does this mean okay so yeah we've done a different um lectures in the past on on the Book of Mormon and how that worked. So the Book of Mormon does have um, statements of the witnesses, uh, and those are at the uh, beginning of the, now they're published at the beginning, they were originally published at the end of the Book of Mormon. Um, and so there's this testimony of the three witnesses and the testimony of the eight witnesses. Um, the three witnesses, we have a pretty good accounts of their experience. And so they are having a, they see the angel uh, each one of those three witnesses, they and they um, have a vision of the angel. Um, what Martin Harris, at some point or other, when he's um, pressed by people, says, um, angels are seen with the uh, the mind's eye, and so angels are are spiritual beings. You do not see them in physically, and so that's uh, and and the vision of the plates that the angel is showing is also seen with the mind's eye. So it's a visionary experience. So that's why I'm saying physically. Uh, they did not see them. In terms of the eight witnesses, the eight witnesses are are having a more physical experience. But what they what they are doing again is that they they um, when they say that we've hefted the plates, that means that they have the the plates are said to be nailed in a box, and they've got the box and they've lifted it and they can see okay the box is heavy, and then they say that we've seen the characters that are engraved thereon and we assert that they are of curious workmanship. And so in Community of Christ, we have one of the characters, surviving characters templates. And so they've seen this writing out of the characters. So they've seen the characters and the characters look like they're ancient and they are testing that they believe that they are. Um, and so that's, that's what um, the eight witnesses have seen. They haven't seen um, the plates directly with their eyes because Joseph Smith told people that they're too spiritual an artifact and they're, they wouldn't be allowed. People would be, they would die if they were to actually physically, you know, see them with their actual physical eyes. And so that's what I mean when I say that the, the plates aren't actually witnessed by um, anybody uh, directly like that. Um, so some participants are asking, 
if uh, if you could do a lecture on all the different branches, and that makes me think of scattering of the saints. Do you have oh yeah, there? yeah. So um, so people are asking, can I do? I'm doing anything I see. So I've done this. Uh, this is my book, right? So scattering of the saints, and this is like all of the different branches, Strangites and Community of Christ, and um, anyway, and and so. People were asking, can we do one where we just talk about uh, the different branches of the Latter-day Saint movement and how they fit together and how they're different from each other? And yeah, I'd love to. That's a, that's a topic that I know a lot about and I find really fascinating. And so we'll put that on the calendar for, for later this uh, summer. And that's all the questions we're going to take? <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I'm glad that uh, you guys enjoyed this. I really did, too. Thanks for all the engagement, and uh, we will see you next week when we talk about uh, uh, whether the Gospel of Luke is actually written by one of the female uh, disciples. <laughs>